I think there is a, a lot of, of fair criticism that is directed to the United Nations. We need to go back to the charter of the United Nations, the founding charter. But we don't have a right to abortion. We don't have other provisions regarding the family. It looks sometimes as if the human rights of Catholics and Christians are not equally human rights than anybody else. It is the role of religion in society that is losing ground. If the UN were not in existence, we would have to invent them. Geneva, Switzerland hosts the largest branch of the United Nations outside of its headquarters in New York. The Holy See Mission to the United Nations is located in Chambassy. We visited Archbishop Silvano Tomasi, permanent observer of the Holy See to the UN, to get a better idea about his work and the relevancy of the Catholic Church represented at the UN in Geneva. Well, I was born near Venice. I studied in New York theology. I became a, I was ordained a priest in New York. And I remained there teaching first at the City University of New York, teaching some sociology. Then uh, after I got my doctorate from Fordham University, good Jesuit school. Eh? And uh, then uh, I, work in a parish. I ended up working for the U.S. Catholic Bishops' Conference in a new office welcoming immigrants and trying to provide pastoral services for them according to their needs all over the United States. And after a few years there, I serve as superior of my religious community, the Scalabrini Fathers. And uh, then I was kidnapped and taken to Rome to be secretary of a council, a pontifical council for migrants and refugees. And from there, one day I was called by the secretary of state who said, how is your health? And I said, well, as far as I know, it's OK. Are you sure? I said, yes. Then he said, tomorrow morning you bring me a letter in which you tell the Holy Father that you accept to go as Nuncio in Ethiopia and in Eritrea and Djibouti. And that's exactly what I, I objected to. And he said, yes, you can think it over for a couple of days. Then he got up and he accompanied me to the door and he said, well, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock you bring the letter. <laughs> and that took care of me and here I am. After seven years in Africa, I came I was sent here to Geneva. Here is a different type. The multilateral system is different, but I see the importance of it. And uh, God has strange ways and he's full of surprises. I didn't certainly think that I ended up in Geneva, <laughs> but here I am pulling the cart in this part of the world. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Um, my first question really is just why have a Holy See representation at the UN in Geneva? Could you just tell us the reasons for the, U the, the Holy See to be here? The presence of the Holy See 
uh, the UN started back in 1964 in New York with a permanent observer in that main seat of the United Nations. And in Geneva, an observer was sent in 1967. You know, the Vatican doesn't have a, a big army or a huge trade uh, uh, volume, but it is the voice of conscience. Here in the international context, together with the, all the states, and you think now here in Geneva, for example, there are over 200 countries represented. This presence of the Holy See is an effort first to remind the, the world community that there are certain basic values without which living together in peace becomes impossible. And second, to keep reminding the conscience of the participants in the international negotiations that we have to give priority to the human person. Uh, the economy is at the service of the human person. Politics are at the service of the citizen, the service of the person, not vice versa. So for that reason, our presence in the international context of, of the UN structure makes some sense to me. And then also there's a difference, isn't there, between the UN in Geneva, of course, and the UN in New York. Could you just tell us what is the importance of the UN in Geneva in comparison with New York? The official seat of the United Nations is uh, New York because the General Assembly meets there and uh, the Security Council is based in New York. The Security Council deal with political issues of war and peace, and it has the power to impose even sanction. So the visibility of the UN, when we think of the UN, we think of the of New York uh, debates that are more dynamic in the sense of that they are politically more e more visible. About 9,500 9, people pay by the United Nations. In Geneva, the largest concentration in the world of UN personnel. And besides, there are all the international functionaries of the different agencies. In fact, the operational or day-to-day -day work, the practical work, of the United Nations to a large degree is carried out through the structures and the international organization based in Geneva, where we have the International Labor Organization, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, the International Organization for Migration, the High Commissioner for Refugees, and you go down the line. We have the practical problems affecting the human family are coordinated and addressed, um, I should say, here in, in Geneva. That's why we use the expression international Geneva, because it's really linked up with uh, a lot of all the countries of the world, in fact. What, what do you say, though, to those who argue that um, being such a secular institution that the UN is, that the Holy See shouldn't really have much to do with it, in the sense that they have everything to gain, but what does the Holy See have to gain from being a, a member or rep having representation? I think there is a, a lot of, of fair criticism that is directed to the United Nations. The newspapers and the media in general don't report much about the achievements of the UN, because if the UN prevents a, a conflict in some regions of Africa, nobody is going to create a big fuss about it. But if it fails to block a war, like uh, say 
between Palestinians and Israelis, then we all become concerned and become very vociferous about. So I think we have to be prudent and realistic in assessing the role of the United Nations. Yes, I think there is a need of reform and especially to democratize a little bit more the process because Right now, the system of the Security Council with the five veto power countries uh, constantly being present and therefore determining what the majority may want or may not want, uh, I think that creates a problem. We need to go back to the charter of the United Nations, the founding charter, where the purpose of this organization is well defined as the protection of the human person, as a way to create peace and development in the world. And we should stick to, the, to those objectives and not be manipulated by one or the other power. Archbishop Tamazi says that if the United Nations were not in existence, it would have to be invented. Appointed by Pope John Paul II, Archbishop Tamazi began his service as permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations in Geneva in 2003. I can say from my experience here in the UN base of Geneva that it is the role of religion in society that is losing ground to a certain degree. Not everywhere and not for every category of people, but in the public projection of what seems to be important, the role of religion is kind of put aside a bit. And we need to reaffirm the value and the contribution of religion to the well-being of society. Regarding the role of some expert group within the structure of the UN that have uh, expressed reservations or criticism on the Ch Catholic Church, for example, saying that the Catholic Church has to change its canon law regarding abortion, regarding uh, gay life and marriage. Uh, I think this is the position of experts, experts of committee and treaties. They don't represent the United Nations necessarily because the decisions of the United Nations are made by the state members of the United Nations. So we, we need to make a distinction. Some experts strongly disagree and accuse the church, the Catholic Church in particular, of being too intransigent in defending the right to life and the right of the family to be made up of, uh, as nature demands, a man and a woman and children, if God sends them. And, uh, but this said, in the official juridical instruments of the United Nations, for example, we don't have a right to abortion. We don't have other provisions regarding the family. And even in the last session of the Human Rights Council of uh, uh, about a, a month and a half ago, we managed to have a, a resolution saying protection of the family passed by the, the vast majority of states instead of the proposal that the European Union and some other wanted to introduce protection of the families, plural, so that every kind of combination of persons could be interpreted as family. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to work quietly, informally, and in a friendly way to convince people that for the good of society 
and the future of the human family, we need to preserve certain fundamental values that are the strength and the help for the progress of, of peoples. And um, what to you are the most urgent topics at the moment is from, the, from the perspective of the Holy See? You know, there are several important concerns that are expressed by the Holy Father, Pope Francis, in a very effective way, and that we try to carry on and translate into uh, the, cons the interest of, of the international community in the context of the United Nations. I would say that some of the major and current issues are the defense of freedom of religion. There are many Christians, in particular Catholics, who are killed or are persecuted in other ways around the world. And uh, the international community doesn't do much about it. It looks sometimes as if the human rights of Catholics and Christians are not equally human rights than anybody else. So I think this is a concern that needs to be brought to the surface. And uh, if you look at what's happening in northern Iraq uh, or in some other areas of the Middle East or in Nigeria where Boko Haram, you see that there is a target chosen specifically because of the faith that people profess. So we are trying to be present and active in a whole series of, uh, of priorities, uh, especially now that the UN system is trying to identify and conclude on new goals for the whole world after 2015. We would like to include in those goals not only decent work, not only respect of life, but also other, other concerns, including development for the poor countries, uh, the protection of the family, uh, and, and so forth. The UN building complex sits on 87 and a half acres of land. The building alone is 600 meters long and houses 2,800 offices. For the Archbishop, he not only has long daily talk to deal with, but also a long daily walk. Just to go back to the peacemaking issue, the situation in Iraq and Syria, I know that Ban Ki-moon has condemned, or he said it could be a crime against humanity, what's gone on in, in northern Iraq. But would you like to see more statements coming out of the UN about this? It's the first time, as far as I am aware, that the Secretary General of the United Nations spends a word on behalf specifically of Christians because there is the will to say minorities in general need to be protected, and we agree fully with that. Minorities need to be protected. But I think the approach may not be the most effective one. We need to emphasize the fact that citizens have to be protected. And the Christians and Catholics, Orthodox Catholics, others, are citizens of their own country and have a right to be protected like anybody else. Considering them a minority sometimes become an, becomes an excuse to invent some special way to deal with them they further emarginate them. Instead, they have to be recognized as full members of society 
with a right to contribute, a duty to contribute to society, and a right to be protected by society, like anybody else. This is a very difficult challenge that we find in many countries, and uh, we need to raise this at the level of human rights in the United Nations, because it's the right thing to do. So I just wonder what, what role does the media play, Your Excellency, in, in helping to get the, the Holy See's um, position across particularly? Sometimes I have the feeling that what makes news is a bit of scandal and a bit of uh, combination of sex and religion that can appeal to the wider audience. And the substantive issues of what we stand for or the good things that are being done become secondary. Uh, so we need to be professional and capable of communicating to the media our point of view in an effective way. So for that, I think we, we have some work to do. And have you noticed a difference in your work under Pope Francis? Has he had some impact, positive impact on your work? Some people say that his great popularity worldwide has made world leaders much more attentive to what the Pope and the Vatican says. Have you experienced that in your own? Yes. Uh, some ambassadors have told me, ah, he is our Pope, Muslim ambassadors, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that they see in, in the genuine attitude and approach to life issues of this person, something authentic, something they can agree with and support. So the big popular response that Pope Francis finds to his speeches or to his gestures, symbolic gestures, is helpful in the sense that people take, take notice of, of this pop popular support and uh, also demand to use this popular support that the Pope has to advance some other issues. Uh, for example, most of the director general of the different agencies of the United Nations here in Geneva have asked to have a private audience with the Pope, and I have arranged for them to, to do this. Uh, and out of these meetings come some interesting developments. For example, with the Red Cross that we have to work out how in emergencies the Catholic structure can help the need to meet the needs of the people while the structure of the Red Cross begins to organize itself but being already in place where some tragedies happen, we can become more effective. So, yes, the popular consensus that the Pope Francis receives translates into some positive reactions and possibilities of cooperation within the international network. But one of the criticisms that one hears now is that the church will often talk about peace and no violence and coming together, but there isn't much explicit mention of, of Christ and that peace is found only really in Christ. Do you think that is a problem and do you think that should be a problem that should be more addressed? I, I see the point that by using the language of human rights and that is common in the United Nations system, we try to reach out to all people, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, people of all persuasions. The language for this common denominator of approach is in a way the language of human rights and respect of the nature of the human person. To take the step forward, as our evangelical brothers, for example, 
insist and that we should to a degree insist that the message of the gospel and the person of Jesus are a force in itself to ferment society and to lead society to a better type of, of life and to the prevention of conflict. Religion can be very effective to the extent that it convinces the hearts of people, changes the, the heart and the conscience of people and forces them to confront themselves and the behavior that leads to violence. I think uh, if we enlarge the number of people who are com deeply convinced because of personal and religious motivation that violence is not the way to resolve problems, but it, that we are one family of God. And as a family of God, we need to respect and love each other and therefore solve problems without killing each other. But we should not knock down or put on the side the approach of our Catholic identity and our belief, because the substance of our belief is not a doctrine, is not a theory of human rights, but it is the person of Christ himself. Every morning at 7.30, the Archbishop celebrates Mass in this small chapel in the basement of the mission. This is also a reminder that in spite of his diplomatic work in the political arena of the UN in Geneva, the Archbishop remains a priest in the service of Christ.